Good morning, guys. Let's begin to do a little bit more reading on Romans. Now, I did not address the fact about Paul. This is one of the, the letters he wrote. His letters were called epistles. Now, he wrote this to the Roman Empire because, you know, he was sailing around those oceans over there. So he was going through Spain, and he decided to stop uh, in Rome so he could speak to the Roman Empire. And he was writing this letter before he hit, before he hit the eye, before he got over there in Spain to, to the Romans. He um, wrote this letter to the Romans, and then he went there and he told them everything in the letters. But he considered himself an apostle to the Gentiles. But he was speaking to the uh, Jews and the Gentiles when he was in Rome. So I just wanted to go back and let you know we're already on Romans 7, and I didn't tell you that. Now, um, I have something here. This is a question and answer. This has to do with Romans 3 and 25. Then we're going to go back over to 7. It says that God died on the cross. Let's read this. It says, by any measure, this idea is earth-shaking. No other religion makes such a claim. No other religion even conceive of deity approaching such a situation. Yet the Bible says that Jesus, the God-man, eternal Son of God, died on the cross as payment for sin of all who trust in him. Why did that happen? When God created the world, it was perfect, fit for the creator. But humanity's disobedience quickly created an in intractable problem. A holy God cannot relate to sin. A breach in a relationship required some form of payment. In the Old Testament, God established a set of animal sacrifices as token payments. Like, you know, they were killing and slaughtering uh, animals on the altar and things like that way back when. So the animal sacrifices were token payments. Important indeed, but not adequate to heal the breach from the beginning it was god's plan to heal the breach himself through an unprecedented action by which god himself would satisfy his own demands for sinless perfection indeed the messiah will come to pay the price for the sins of all people if jesus were merely human a good man would have died and that would have been the end of his story and ours. If Jesus were only divine, we would not have seen and heard him or known firsthand about God's love. But fully human and fully divine, Jesus told us about God and then satisfied God's own requirement. He was the sinless son standing in place of sinful people satisfying the perfect justice of a holy God. That's the meaning of an amazing biblical truth of God's death for us. The purpose, our fellowship with God, the motive, God's love for us, the means, Roman crucifixion, the result, resurrection, eternal life for all who believe. Amen. Now that's pretty good. So it's, it's as though he was standing in the gap between human and, and divine, you know, between something you don't know of, heavenly things, and then humanistic things, though he's like, I'm here in between. So this is where my death go, right here in between these two things, to get these things to come together. I know it sounds kind of far-fetched, but it's like standing in the gap. You know how you pray for somebody, you say, I'm standing in the gap for this person because they can't be here today. They need this prayer to go up. And they could be somewhere else and agreeing in that prayer, but they couldn't come there with you, you know, standing in the gap. So um, he sort of was in between the human divide, Jesus Christ. Isn't that something? Now, um, let's get back to what we we're reading here. We're on seven. We've already read through three, four, and five, I believe. So we're, we're all the way on, on seven. Okay, I want to know what is the Pax Romania. I don't want to talk about that. That has to do with them paying taxes way back in Rome, way back when they were paying taxes when things were under construction and 
things were starting up. We'll talk, we'll be about that later. So let's go back over here. Uh, let's start at 7 and 1. It says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. How that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he live. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. She then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she should be called an adulteress. If her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Now, wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members, to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So he's just expressing here that it's no longer to do with the law. You are alive, but you're not going under the law. You're not stuck under the law because now we are dead in, in, in trespasses. You know what I'm saying? Because what the things with the law had to do with them giving a sacrifice for something. They have to pay the price for this and pay the price for that. This is going to be hard to explain to you guys. But the sacrifice with the law was something tangible that you could see. But the sacrifice with the spirit it's something you cannot see. It's intangible. It has to do with your heart. Because it has to do with the flesh and the heart. It's going to be hard for me to explain. But I'm going to, I'm going to go back and pull out some scriptures. It says, Wherefore, brethren, what he's explaining is to the Jew is that they're not entitled to live under the law anymore if they believe that Jesus Christ died for them. They have the ability to live under the spirit and the grace of God and leave the law behind. Not the letter of the law, because the Ten Commandments stand, that should not steal, that should not kill, that should not commit adultery. He's not saying the letter of the law. He's not saying the works therein of the law. But he's saying the physicality of it living and doing the things, sacrificing, giving you a blood offering on the altar and all those things. You don't have to do those things because when you got Jesus coming here, he said, I'm in between what you're doing. You go through me for your sacrifices. You go through me for your faith in your promises. You don't have to go through the priest. He's the only priest. Jesus said, I'm the only high priest you go through because I'm sitting up here in heaven and you go through me. So forget about that law of Moses where you got to go through that high priest. Remember when they said a veil was broken when Jesus died? You don't have to worry about going up in there uh, where they have to go up in there and everything covered, the altar covered. The priest got to go up there for you and give the sacrifice and do everything for you. And you got to give this to the priest. No, the priest is not in control. The Jew, the, and so the Jews now have to understand that you got to worship a different way the same God. You got to worship in a different way because now your worship is going through Jesus Christ and what he's laying out for you. And this is what Paul is telling them. I'm bringing in a new thing to you that you might not understand, but it's just the thing that was spoken of by the prophets way back when is Jesus Christ and how he's going to lay out the plan for you to worship and serve him. And so this is what he's expressing to them, to the, to the Jews and Gentiles in Rome. And this is in right here in seven. And uh, I kind of said a mouthful, but I'm going to have to get some backup scriptures for you guys on these verses. Now we go down here, it says a believer is not made holy by the law. You understand? I kind of just told you that. 
What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known thus, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. Okay? See, the law is put into effect to give them direction of how to live. That's what they were using it for. But they were using it for everything because they had nothing else to stand on. But now that when Jesus Christ comes up here, you can look at the Ten Commands because the physicality of it stands. Those things stand because they are honorable. However, if you stumble, you're not going to have to die. They're not going to kill you. Back then, everything was put to death, that person. Boom, he dead on the spot. You know what I'm saying? Your life, was, your life was nil. But now people can make a mistake and that not to take advantage of the grace of God, but they can, do the, they can make a mistake do whatever they're doing and say, Lord, please forgive and go to, you know, fasting and praying. And the Lord Jesus said, I'm the high priest in your heart. You know, so you also got to go to get under a good church, but you want to go through the Holy Spirit for those things. You want to go through God. But let's go back here. So what he's saying here in this seven right here said that he didn't know. That he was sinning because the law told him that he shouldn't covet. So now I know I'm coveting something. I want something that's not mine. Or I see something that's not mine. You're not supposed to do that. Okay? And then it said, but sin taken occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of conspicuous. For without the law, sin was dead. If I didn't have the law to, to know I was sinning, how would I know I sinned? <laughs> I don't want to sound contradictory, but if I didn't have something to, to measure my physicality by, how would I know what I'm doing is wrong? Okay? It says, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Amen. In the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. This is Paul saying what he found that this command was... It's unto death, okay? For sin taken occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? Made me sin because I know it's wrong and I do it anyway? God forbid, but sin that it might appear sin working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Okay, so he, he's expressing we're all sold under sin. The law is spiritual. And then we in here 15. Romans 7 and 15, the strife of the two natures under the law, the strife of these two natures. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would that do, I not. Okay, listen to that. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwell in me. It's my sin nature. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. You have the will to do whatever. But how to put that will in action in the right way. Most people don't find that. They don't know they don't know what to do. Okay? Now listen to this. For the good that I would do, for the good would I not do, but the evil which I would not, I do that. I won't do the good thing, but I do the bad thing. Listen to that. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. It's the sin nature. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. 
For I delight in the law of good after the inward man, but I see another law of my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. The law of your mind. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Amen. So he's serving two laws. You see that? He's serving the law in the mind, and then he's serving the law in the flesh, which he's serving God and man. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 15 and 57 here, and we're going to end chapter, verse, uh, chapter 7. 1 Corinthians 15 and 57. Is that right? Yeah, 15 and 57. So you really have two natures in your body, <laughs> a good devil and a bad devil, believe it or not. And at any time you can make a decision because it's the will in you. God gave you will. It says, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the works of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to... Uh, put this video up and give you some outline scriptures and this right here is just explaining to the jews as well as the gentiles that you have a good nature and you have a bad nature the commands of god is just sort of the rules laid out for you the physicality of living and they lived by the physicality of the law that's what they the jews stand up on Everything must be by the law as far as their concern. And so he's trying to get their mind to think the only thing you need the law for is to see your physicality, that the spiritual body, which is your mind, it must be unto, unto God, unto Jesus. Because guess what? Your mind tell your flesh what to do. Your mind. And he said, I didn't even know that I was sinning until I could see what covetedness is lying is deceit i didn't know until i could see these things the law reveals what things are so you can say well this is something i'm doing or you know you can take a look at it and sometimes people begin to do more of these things because they know that's you know that's some you know i don't know if they just do it in their body and that not thinking in their mind but anyway he said that uh he was beginning to understand that now I can see the law and, and, and my body wants to do more of it. But it's all the working of the mind when it comes to the spirit of God. Because look at what it said right here. It said, oh, wretched man. It says, um, he said some here about the mind. He says, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. It's two things. It's your body and it's your mind. So you have control of your body through your mind. So the thing is to get the two to work together. One, you want to serve God with your mind, the spirit of God, but you want your flesh to follow your thoughts you know what i'm saying and that's in every individual you had two things going you got the fleshly man and you got the the good man you got your you got a good heart and you got a good idea of what you want to do but many people are distracted because you have two natures warring against you now in eight it says there there is therefore no condemnation to them which are in christ jesus who walk 
not after the flesh, but after the spirit. It says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus have made me free from the law of sin and death. Amen. And then it says, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Amen. So we're going to pick it up on 8 and 5 when we come back. All right. Have a great morning, guys.